really made up some time. I'm absolutely chuffed a bit. And you'll never guess where we're going next. The most unlikely place to go fishing. If anyone's ever heard of the town of Dudley in the West Midlands, that's where we're going. But believe it or not, there is good fishing there. All will be revealed when we get to Dudley. So now the rod race has brought us here to the most unlikely setting in the middle of the Midlands, halfway between Dudley and Wolverhampton, you find this little oasis. Now this is Himley Hall, beautiful old estate hall, and with it of course, what do you get with every estate hall? A nice lake. A nice lake. Yeah. And in fact, we've come to the Great Lake. A uh, bit of a dodgy night last night, Mick. We were so tired we couldn't get up for dawn, but... Uh... Yeah, well that's why I've kept my glasses on, because you should see the state <laughs> of my eyes. Well, what, what are we going to catch here, Matt? Well, I'm hoping we'll catch crucian carp. Some of my earliest memories of fishing here, when I was about 18, a thrusting young buck that I was. I haven't been here, Mick, for 20 years, which has given my age away a bit. <laughs> but I'm told the crucians are still here. And yep. this lake, the Great Lake, we're going to fish for crucian carp. And then if we get a chance, we'll zip across to one of the other lakes behind the hall and we'll try for the grass carp. Yeah, well, I hope it's as easy as when you was a lad, because you know what it's like when you come back to places? They're never what they used to be, are they? No, they're not really, but this is still a lovely place. Yeah. I mean, you'll be quite impressed with the lake. And I think where we need to head for, Mick, just down at the bottom end, along the dam there, there's some lily pads. And that's a good spot for crucians. So yeah. Well, they're going to be looking for cover, aren't they, in this bright sunshine? Yeah. yeah. In the nest, got a salmon. Well, that fish is well over four pounds. Well, we do need a mirror carp, man. Yeah. Well, well, this, this fish yeah. is well over 20 pounds. Yes. Try to catch you an eel, and I did. Brace of carp. Oh, Nick, I think this could be a rug. Really beautiful example of the species. This is a big roach. Nick, that's a good tent. Well, in this instance, Matt, yours is bigger than mine. Now, ground baiting or mass ground baiting is banned here at Himley Hall, but if you're going to fish the open-ended feeder, you're allowed to use a little bit of ground bait to plug your feeder up. I think, anyway, that's how it used to be. So I'm going to make up a bit of a mix now. I'm only going to use this to block up my open-ended feeder, but you could use this for fishing for tension cruising carp. It's one of my favourite mixes. Now, the first thing to do when you're mixing ground baits is to mix the dry ingredients. So you open the bag. I'm going to mix together here the brown crumb with the expo, just a little bit of each. And basically, I'm going to mix these 50-50. Once you've poured them into the bowl, then you've got to really mix them up. Use your hand like a food mixer and really make a good job of this. And there you are. When you've done that, you end up with a nice, even colour, two well-mixed bases there. OK, now the next thing you're going to need is some liquid. And here's a little tip for you. If you're going fishing with sweet corn, don't waste the juice. Use it to flavour your ground bait because it's nice and sweet. It's got lots of sugar added to it. The point with sweet corn juice is that it's very sweet. It's ready sweetened and flavoured. And fish love to eat corn, so the juice makes a great liquid additive to dampen your ground bait. Add it a little bit at a time don't want too much all in one go. Now, when you're mixing, you need to really work the mix vigorously to try and get as much air into it as you possibly can. You want it to be nice and fluffy, not stodgy. Now, the liquid mix, you just sprinkle it like that across the ground bait. You don't need loads. So what we're trying to do is create a damp ground bait, not a really wet, soggy one. And if you mix it thoroughly, what you end up with is a lovely ground bait that you can squeeze together in one hand. But when you do this, it all breaks down again into a nice crumb with no lumpy bits. Real good fish attractor. Perfect. Matt? Yeah? Have you got a disgorger? Yeah, why? I'm serious, I've got the hook caught in me, man. 
Hang on. Uh, it's all right, mate. I've got it out. I've got it caught in my tooth. Well, I've uh, rigged up for these crucians with some tackle I haven't used for years, actually, one of these old floats. It's a very sensitive little float. We used to use floats like this when I was a nipper. And they're perfect for crucians, actually, because they've got a very sensitive, fine tip. The thing with crucians is they're very shy, biting fish. So I've plumbed the depth to get it exactly right. So I'm literally fishing just a few centimetres over depth with the corn hook bait just on bottom. Well, this is classic crucian behaviour. I had my float sticking up out of the water by about a couple of centimetres, and I've got some little dibs and lifts. And you might think, well, it's just small fish knocking at it, but it isn't. I know that it's crucian carp. I can just tell they're so shy. And one of the other reasons I know there are crucians here is just at the back of my swim by the lily pads, I've seen some little clusters of bubbles break in the surface. And I know that they're crucian bubbles. They're a little bit um, fatter, if you like, slightly bigger bubbles than tench bubbles, which is more of a kind of Alka-Seltzer fizz. But with a crucian, you get proper bubbles coming up. And I've even seen one break the surface. So it, it's got all the hallmarks of classic crucian fishing, and they are so infuriating. They really are. Hey, Matt, I've got one here. What do you reckon to this? <laughs> You're not going to count that, are you? Uh, not really. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. There it goes. Yeah. Yes, I'm in. I was flicking some little bits of worm out just past the pads and I could see fish taking them, so I shallowed up a bit. Just got about half an inch of worm on and here it comes, here's the culprit. And as you might expect on a piece of worm, it, it, it's a perch. It's not, not a very big one, but very welcome all the same. Well, and luckily it hasn't done what most perch do. It hasn't swallowed the hook and look at that. Barbly suck, it's just fell out, which is what we want it to do. And a uh, cracking little perch, it's not a cruising carp. In fact, I think if I keep fishing worm, I'm going to get more of these, so I'm probably going to go back to bread paste. Perch just don't like bread paste, so I shouldn't get bothered by them again. Right, well, for a public park fishery, I'm very surprised how easy it is to get bites. Just let's hope the next one is the species we're after. Lovely clear water, just look at that. And off he goes. Perfectly camouflaged for when he's in amongst those lily stems. Oh, look at this! <laughs> well, I've just dotted my float down till it was a mere pimple on the surface, and I've hooked a fish that's ramping around the swim. I don't think this is a crucian. I think it's probably a tension. If this fish gets in the pads, I'm going to lose it, I think. It's gone right underneath the lilies. I'm managing to steer it through. I'm sure it's a tench the way it's fighting. Oh, I don't know, this might be a crucian, you know. I think it is, I think it's a big crucian carp. Oh, that's incredible. It looks like a real big fish. Really fighting hard, I've just seen a flash of gold and it's, it's boring down to get under the lilies, but I'm getting on top of it. It looks like a very good crucian. Oh, I've got him in the pectoral fin, but it counts. Oh, yes. Oh, there we are. Now that's what it's all about. A little dinner plate. Now, the crucian carp is an incredible fish. Unfortunately, I've hooked it in the root of its pectoral fin. Now, you might be wondering how we can tell this is a crucian. There is a lot of controversy currently about the crucian carp. The first thing to look for is its rounded dinner plate shape. An elongated dorsal fin, that's very important. And look here, it's got no barbules and the crucian carp doesn't have barbules, whereas the king carp strains do. Well, I think I'm going to try for another one, because, strictly speaking, I did hook it in its pectoral fin. But, hey, everything's fair in love and the great rod race, isn't it? So I'm going to count it if I don't get another one, but I am going to try. And there he goes. Wasn't that a good fight? Fantastic. Forgotten how good fun crucian carp fishing is. 
with this map. I think it's a roach. Oh, got a superb roach. Oh, it's solid in the pads. I reckon that's not far off two pounds. If that's a roach, it's a big one. Ah, oh, come on. Hey, Matt. The one that got away. It's, a, I mean, it's well over a pound oh, on a single maggot. Nice job. Well, that was a pretty short and sharp fight, and although the terminal tackle I'm using is quite delicate, I've got the right rod that's going to cushion the fight and uh, allow me to put a bit of pressure on it. To be honest, pressure is what I really put on that fish to get it through these lily pads. Taking a look at it, I'm 99.9% .9 sure it is a proper roach. Uh, it's got the downturned mouth, it's the right colour, the dorsal is in line with the anal fin, so um, I think we can safely say that is a roach. And not a bad one either. Getting on for two pounds, I would think. Now, let's get her back in quickly. I don't want to Mess the fish around. Off she goes. Oh, she's going off like lightning. Cool. Look at her go. <laughs> Another job well done. Well, I think this might be a crucian carp, this one. It's gone right under the pads again. Really difficult to get them out of this swim and also to avoid foul hooking the fish, you know. But I've just switched over to bits of meat and it is a crucian. There he is. That's a super crucian. And uh, it's mission accomplished, folks. How's that? And let me tell you, we're rocking and rolling on this challenge now because with each session, I feel we're gathering momentum. Now, let me show you how I caught the fish. But don't tell Mick Brown. The key is to make the setup as sensitive as possible. So what I'm doing is dotting the float down so there's a tiny little bit of the tip showing. I've gone down to a low diameter hook length. It's about 1.6 pounds breaking strain with a little size 18 hook. But the real key is to plumb the depth so that the bait is just touching the bottom. And when the crucian picks it up, the float blips under. But you wouldn't expect a poor old devil like Brownie to have reactions quick enough to hit those bites. But he might do all right with the grass carp. Well, it's amazing, actually, that once you crack the method, the fishing just becomes so easy. Sometimes it's the small things in fishing, the little changes that you make. Maybe I should let Mick in on the secret. Fishing's too good to miss out on, really. <laughs> Tiny little touch. Fought like a tiger. It's a lovely little fish. I think he's an old warrior, this one. Well, the crucians are coming really thick and fast now, and this one's an absolute beauty. Lovely, delicate little bite, and a nice fish at the end of it. And I think that one. Judging by the other one, it's probably two pound. Oh, I have to stand up. Well, I'm in, and this might be my crucian if I can just get it out of the weeds. Oh, dear, it's looking a bit nasty. Ah, oh, it looks like I've got my crucian if I can just... Let's get it in. Please, please, please. Oh, not a bit of a shambles, but I've got it in the net. <laughs> I've got a crucian, Matt. I've got a fish right in the pads. <laughs> oh, I've got a crucian. Well, look at this, Mick. I've got the other fish that Himley Hall's famous for. You've caught your cruisian. What have you got, Matt? And I've got a nice tench. Oh, yes. So, yeah. I'll tell you what, mate, we've had a cracking day sport, haven't we? I'll tell you what, I never expected a day like this. It really has been a fantastic day. It has. In the middle of Dudley. Yeah. Right in the black country. It's a yeah. day ticket yeah. fishery. That's the best part. It doesn't cost much to fish here. You can just turn up on the bank and come fishing. and. And I think with that, Mick, it's good night from me. And good night from these pair. 
So, here we are, sitting outside the hall, feeling pretty smug about life, Mick. I think you can say that our cruise and carp session was a bit of a success. It was, yeah. A pleasant surprise, really. I never expected it to go that well. And it was brilliant, wasn't it? Great yeah, fishing. Yeah, really good, yeah. Great weather. But, uh, I mean, we mustn't get too complacent, because next on the hit list is the grass carp. And that's worried me right from the start. It's not going to be easy, and uh, we've already had one go at it. And to be quite frank, we messed it up, didn't we? We're actually here, somewhere out in the wilds of Shropshire, and I actually live in Shropshire, and even I don't know where we are. But this lake's not been fished, really. It's a wild lake. Well, I'm going to fish for these grass carp on surface bait. When I got here, I was delighted to see some fish. Suddenly got this awkward, swirling wind. This is going to ruin it. Well, I'm not so sure I'm going to get this one out. I saw the fish, cast to it, and it took it straight away, and there's nothing I could do. I'd... I struck and literally two seconds and it was solid. I saw it dive down. I didn't give it a chance to run, but... You've got quite a strong line on. I've got an eight pound line on. Yeah, it should pull through. It's starting... Oh. No, I'll pull through. Oh. I felt lucky just to get a tape, but uh, for that to happen... Yeah. So, unfortunately, the grass carp fishing went wrong because the weather deteriorated, we never saw another fish on the surface, and it was way too weedy to fish on the bottom, which brings us back here. Now, Mick, little interesting story. Many, many years ago, when I was fishing here at Himley Hall, and I saw a peculiar-looking fish in the margins, and at first I thought it was a giant chub, but it wasn't. It was one of the first experimental stockings of grass carp. Now, do you remember yeah. the movement in the country when they were put into lots of lakes as a means of weed control? That's right, yeah. And at the time, they didn't think they could be caught on anglers' baits? No. Right from the start, they said anglers wouldn't catch them. You know, don't even try. Straight away, we were catching them on maggots, bread, sweet corn. They've turned out to be a good sport fish. Yeah. But very, very difficult to catch at times. Yeah. And in fact, Again, the weather factor. This is really our last chance, isn't it? It's forecast to be a bright, sunny day later. And the great thing is that not only are the grass carp still in this pool behind us, mm. but they're also in another pool here called the Rock Pool. Now, those fish actually shouldn't be in that lake, Mick. They were taken out of the Great Lake and they've been held there temporarily. And in fact, our job is to catch a few and move them back yeah. into the little stream behind the pool so they can put yeah. them back into the Great Lake. Yeah. You're a bit like Mr. Magoo, are you? Yeah. Right, let's see what sort of disturbance this makes. Nice. Yeah, I've got no choice, right? So dead, are you? There's no pages in your house. Now, these grass carp are proving to be really difficult to catch, actually. They're cruising around a lot, but they're not feeding. And I've come up with a different idea. What I think I need to do is to anchor a bait out in the middle of the lake and just leave it there and hope that one of the fish cruising past will have a pop at it. And this is what I've come up with. On my line, I've squeezed on two SSG shots. And then below that, five feet away, I've got a pop-up boilie. And what happens is this. The, the boilie's on the hook. It floats up to the surface and it lies in the surface film with the hook hanging down below. It's a long shot, but it's worth a go. Well, there's been a few fish cruising around, but none more so, actually, than opposite our little park bench. So I'm going to try a bait out into the central area. <laughs> Easiness there. They look so easy to catch and they're cruising up to the baits, just carrying on past them. I think these guys have seen a few baits before. It's there again, it's, it's just under the surface now, moving left to right. It. Yeah, yeah. It's right over your bait. It is, but it's not moving, it's not stopping. No, but you can probably smell all that uh, corn steep liquor permeating the water. He's going round and round that area, he's, he's got a whiff of it. Okay, go on, go on, go on. Oh, yeah. 
Yes. 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 <laughs> Who would have thought it? <laughs> what about that? We've had tremendous difficulty catching these fish, and I'm just sitting here with a little pop-up, an orange pop-up boilie out there, and the fish just came up and took it sweet as a nut. It's a nice fish, Mick. It is, oh, yeah. it's a big grass carp. Now, <sighs> these fish wallow around a lot until you get them in the net, at which point they usually go ballistic, so let's see what happens. Yeah! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big grass carp, Mick. That's a, a clonking great fish. Look at that. Absolutely magnificent. A fish really like a huge chub. It's going to give me a good beat in that. A fish like a, a huge chub, but you'll notice its nose is pointed. And, uh, these fish can eat all sorts of weeds, sort of microscopic plankton, algae, daphnia, all the sort of microscopic weed and minute animal life that you'll find in the water, but they will fall for surface baits. And this one did. Beautiful fish. That's a big fish, Mick, that. Yeah, it is, isn't it? And let me tell you, it took some catching, didn't it? Well, I didn't think we were going to get one, to be quite honest. I think that was a pretty good feat of angling, man. Oh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> no, I'm not to say that. I'm the sting in the tail, <laughs> no, no, I can't think of one. No, you've done a good job. It's your personal best? I think it's 13, 12. Well, you're way over it, mate. 15 pounds, 13 ounces. Oh, clonker. <laughs> hey, hey, well Cheers, done. mate. 15. Good lad. Oh. I can actually get in here. Oh, can you? Yeah. Good. I'll lower the fish in. How about that? It's gone off a tree. Another good job done. Fine job. And let me tell you, we're rocking and rolling on this challenge now because with each session, I feel we're gathering momentum. From here, <laughs> we could nip down to the local canal around the Stourbridge area and try and catch a little gudgeon. Yeah, well, I'm just about up for that. We're definitely going to need one of these, Matt. Now, Mick, this really is a trip down memory lane because I'll tell you an interesting fact about this place. I know I'm full of them at the moment, but the very first fish I ever caught was here, just a few yards here below the bridge, and it was the fish we're trying to catch. It was a gudgeon. Well, do you think they're still here? That's the point. I don't know, really. I would think so. There used to be loads of them then. I mean, we used to have competitions to see how many we could catch on the same maggot. Well, I started my fishing exactly the same way, but that was on the Birmingham to Warwick Canal. And fishing for exactly the same species, the old gudgeon. And I mean, they're reliable, aren't they, for kids when they start? They were then. Yeah. Kids start with different things now with all yeah. these commercial yeah. fisheries, but back then it was about the only thing we could catch. Yeah. Do you know what my record was? I can still remember it now. In four hours, and it was just world record at the time and we're near me mate 212 gudgeon God, that's a lot of gudgeon isn't it but we'll settle yeah. for one that would win many a match wouldn't it it would that's about what seven pound no, fish and he had three maggots in my box well himley hall i think was a great success we've gained a lot of momentum we started off fishing for the crucian carp and that was just outstanding and then we moved on to the grass carp and believe me it was harder than it will probably end up looking on the telly because the fish were very difficult to catch and to get a result like that well we're just gathering momentum at the moment with each passing day but we've just left Himley Hall and we've moved down now to this canal where I started life as a fisherman many many years ago and I'm hoping that we're giving ourselves a little bit of relaxation here by fishing for a tiny little fish called the gudgeon. It's one of our smallest freshwater species. There used to be stacks of them here in the canal and I'm hoping that we'll get a little break here, just a nice couple of hours fishing. And really, I'm using the same tactics as I used all those years ago. I've got a very delicate little float, some small shots down the line. The shots used to be a bit bigger and a little bit higgledy-piggledy in those days but I'm fishing nice and sensitively. We've got pinkies for bait, tiny little maggots, and uh, hopefully, oh. well, how about that? It, right uh, on cue, is that, a, uh, is that a gudgeon, Mick? No, it's just dropped off and it was a perch. Was it really? Yeah. They... <sighs> it might be a, well, there's still fish here anyway. Yeah. So at least we know there's some fish about. Yeah. Hope we're not gonna be plagued by perch, mate.
I've just caught a nice piece of toilet paper. <laughs> It's disgusting. I'm chucking it back. I'm not taking it home. If I had a touch there, Mick. Oh, I've got I've, one. I've got one on as well. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> I've got one on, yeah. Double gudging? Hey. <laughs> Yeah, it is, it's a god. How about that? We've got two at once. They're still here. I told you they were. You're right, yeah. Is mine any bigger than yours? Oh, mine, oh, it's mine's much bigger. bigger than yours. It is, actually. Yeah. It's Look twice the size. Yours is a specimen. Look yeah. at that. Beautiful. Should have got the net out for that yeah. one. No, it's not a netter. Now, the gudgeon's a very interesting little fish. Over in East Anglia, you know, they call them window carp because they're almost semi translucent. Yeah. Is that right? And, yeah, and it's got like a sort of dark brown back. When you twist it in the light, Look how you get that blue sheen, and then it's got like mottled colours running down towards the base of its tail. Yeah, it is quite a pretty fish. I must must have been. I've caught a lot of them, but I've never before taken the time to see and, and look closely. Can you imagine if they grew really big? Yeah. Now the beautiful. gudgeon, to help it find its food in this rather coloured canal, has got these tiny little barbules on the front of its nose, just hanging down below its mouth there, yeah. and they find food that way. Mm. And in fact, the way you can tell a small barbel from a gudgeon is that the barbel has four barbules and the gudgeon has only got two. Yeah. And talking of food, they are in fact food themselves because these are the bottom of the food chain. These are a real delicacy for eels and perch and pike and even zander. Yeah. So take care, little gudgeon. Yeah. It's dangerous on the streets. You want to tie up on Nick's float? <laughs> Sticking so far out the water, you'll be able to anchor up no problem on it. You're quite cruel to me, Matt. You can see how sensitive I am. Well, I'll tell you what, you're a great deal more sensitive than your float. <laughs> he strikes and he scores again. Quite remarkable. Look at that. Oh, read him and wheat brownie. Do you know people used to eat these in the olden days? Yeah, apparently they used to just put them into a pie. They didn't used to gut them or anything. Bagging up now. Oh, that yeah. is a good one, mate. It's a netter. Polly, it's a oh, perch. it's a perch. Fantastic, mate. And the young man from Shropshire roars into the lead. There's the bites. Oh, it's come off. Oh. Actually, it's oh, good quite and. a good one. Good and. Oh, no wonder it's a perch. Oh. Bagging up now, Brownie is. Hey, mate! Mate! I'd like to kill a man who's mowing his lawn opposite us for ruining my tranquility. Eight seconds, bite to this. Oh, I've got one as well. Oh, now this is a good one. Well, mine's quite an average one, but yours is an absolute whopper. It's a monster, mate. Look at that. Mate. You've done it again, mate. That's a specimen. Look specimen. at that. Yeah. Real knobbly old boy, isn't he? He's yeah. seen a bit of life, this lad. I'll say yes, yeah. Matt. Yeah? This could be a record shaker. Oh, you got one on? Yeah. Hey, blimey, that's a good one. If, hey, if this is a gudgeon... because it, if that's a gudgeon, mate, you've got a real good fish there. I'm ready oh, with the net. No, it's... Oh, it's, oh, what it's is a it? roach, it's isn't it? It's a roach, yeah. It's nearly too on, big for the net. Oh, <laughs> good lad. <laughs> look at that. Hey, look at that. <laughs> now, when we were kids, if we caught something like yeah. that, we'd have talked about it for I know. about three weeks. I know. That's a beauty, Oh, mate. yeah. Look at that. That's a nice fish for a canal. It, and it, look at the beautiful condition it's in as well. Super. Yeah. Oh, I've got one on now as well. Real net shaker here. Check this hey, out, Mick. What a bonus. This, it's a taste. This is an Matt, amazing Matt, bonus. Net, put the net under it. Don't All lose right, it. go on, then. We'll Bring... tell people why in a minute. I can't believe... I'll tell you what, we need a bit of lock in this race, and we've got it. We have, actually. This is the lock we've been waiting for. Now, the dace is normally a fish found in flowing water, Mick. It's called the silver dart of the river, as you well know. And at first glance to people at home, it might look a bit like your roach, but in fact, it's very different. It's much slimmer bodied for a start. Just bring your roach in and we yeah. can see the difference. There you are, slimmer body, silvery blue sheen, which is quite similar, but altogether a different shape fish. And look at the red fins on your roach. It's yeah. deeper bodied, yeah. redder finned. And we're extremely lucky, I think, to have caught a dace because they're an unusual capture from the canal, aren't they? Yeah, they certainly are. I mean, they're normally associated with running water. And, uh, th you know, this really puts us a little bit in front, doesn't it? It does. Let's just slip these fish okay. back. 
And I think the one thing that we should say, Mick, is that that is a big bonus. We're, yeah. we're on a good roll at the moment yeah. because and we've had the crucian carp, we got that grass carp, yeah. then we got a gudgeon, and yeah. now we've got a dace. Yeah. So in a very short space yeah. of time, we've made up a lot of ground. Yeah, but do you know something? We're forgetting it's a race, aren't we? Yeah. We're, we're having so much fun here on the canal that we've almost forgotten it's a race, and you know we, we better start packing up, <laughs> moving on. Is that a dace? I think it might be. But that's Tell a dace. What, that's a good dace. Oh, oh, oh. That's wow. a nice dace, that is, mate. Tell you what, I'm really coming back here. I've had perch, I've had roach, I've had gudgeon, and now a clonking great dace. Do you remember in some of the tougher modes we said we need a break, we've got to get a break? Yep. Well, I yep. feel that at the moment we're getting the breaks. Yeah, this is the break we wanted. Good stuff. Bonus fish. Yeah. Well done, Brownie. So what did you think of that then, Brownie? Well, I'm glad I came with you down old memory lane. It was uh, brilliant fishing. Took me back, I'll tell you. Yeah, well, I know that this is a serious race and physically and mentally is quite tiring, but this was just a little pep-up tonic and we had a bonus with the dace, we caught a gudgeon, we're cooking on gas, mate, and I feel this, this race is on, I know we keep saying it, yeah. but we're catching up ground here. Well, there's still a couple of difficult ones, but, you know, I think we're in with the chance of doing it. Now, you might be wondering what Mick and I are doing sitting here on this shingle bank in the middle of the night, but actually we've got an interesting story to tell. One of the things that's always concerned us with this challenge is that it might founder not so much on the bigger fish, the big species, you know, the, the carp and the pike and all that sort of thing, but on the mini species, things like stone loach particularly, and we were very worried about catching a stone loach. It's a very rare species of fish nowadays. It lives under stones in rivers, and we literally drew a blank every time we tried to find a venue that might contain one. We never intended to catch one on rod and line because the chances of that are very slim. We'd always intended to use our little friend here to net one out. Any road up, we really struggled to find a venue, and then we had a stroke of luck, and that was that literally one of the lads from the crew came up to my local pub, and the landlord said, well, I can remember Stone Loach in this part of the river many, many years ago. But that's not the whole story, is it, Mick? Well, no, because I checked out Stone Loach on the internet. There's loads of information there, but one little bit of information stood out, and that was the fact that the Stone Loach, the fish we're after, is nocturnal. So we think that using our little net here, we might even be able to catch one for you. Now, we've never intended to catch loach on, on rod and line because they're tiny little fish. So this is probably the best way to catch one. And this is what we're going to use. Let's see if we can find one for you. Oh, there's a big one. What's that? Oh! Look, keep still, keep still, don't move. It's a real stone loach. There he goes. He's gone into the edge here, don't move. There, there he is, there he is. There he is. Oh, he's shot away. <laughs> Yes, yes, got him. Yes. Got him. <laughs> you got him. You got him. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, now, don't lose him. Don't lose him. Let's take him onto the shore. Yeah. Don't want to lose. No. <laughs> it's definitely one, isn't it? Yes, yeah, a stone loach. There it is. This is a really peculiar-looking fish. It's almost catfish-like, actually. It's pectoral fin. It's ever such a crafty little devil. Have a look at his head. You see the barbules sticking out at the front there, Mick. Yeah, the six isn't there on this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it's got a very smooth body with its, its dorsal fin set ever so well back. And then look at this tail. It's yeah. really blunt, yeah. almost like a tench tail, like a paintbrush. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Very thick wrist to it. Now, yeah. these fish like a, a stony habitat, obviously. They live under the stones and they feed on all sorts of microscopic organisms. I mean, we found that one pretty easy, so there must be quite a few there. Oh, I think there's a lot there. Yeah. But while we're here, we could actually go for another species on the list, which is the fish called the bullhead. Now, I know yeah. that they are here, so... Yeah, well, they, they do tend to uh, live in the same area. And I did a bit of reading on this. I think the bullheads actually eat the small loach. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think there is a connection there. So where there's loach, there's probably there bullheads. There should be bullheads, yeah. yeah. Let's see if we can see a bullhead now. But just lift this flat rock here, Mick. Is that one under your net there? Oh, don't, don't move it, this one under your net. I think a lot of the bullheads are free swimming, Mick. Just lift that one there, Mick. What happens is they get into the crevices and you can't scoop the net under them. Go on, just go under the stone, go, on, go under the stone. Yeah, I've got it. Oh, I've yeah. got two, actually. Have you? Yeah. Now, these are, these are bullheads. Oh. oh, yes. You can see they're almost like, they're flat-headed little fish 
with very big pectoral fins. And I would imagine that to a small creature, these would be quite a fearsome predator, actually. You find them in streams and brooks, occasionally in ponds. They never grow very large. About the size of your thumb would be a massive one. So in fact, Mick, coming out here in the middle of the night, we've caught two species that were on our hit list, bullheads and stone loach, yeah. which we were very worried about catching, actually. Yeah, and more interestingly, we've uncovered a secret little world little underwater world that probably no one realises exists. Yeah, a nocturnal world. Yeah. And I'll bet you, if you came and searched these shallows during the daytime, you wouldn't see half the fish. It's alive with them. Yeah. It's alive with yeah. them. Anyway, we'll let these little two chaps swim. They may be small, but they've certainly given us another two yeah. notches on the old bedpost. Here we are now at Hopsford Hall Fishery, which is somewhere near the village of Woolvey, I think, which is just off the M6. So we've driven south, and uh, it's a beautiful day, that's for sure. Now, our target here is something quite unusual. It's a species of fish called the wild carp, and these are the original carp brought into this country round about the Middle Ages by the monks. So it's a very ancient strain of fish, and there are very, very few of them left. We've had a terrible job trying to find a fishery with wild carp in it, but we're told here at Hopsford Hall on a small lake called the Duckery that we're going to find our quarry, so we will see. How are you feeling this morning? Tired? <sighs> yeah, I am a bit tired this morning, yeah. I must admit. I was OK yesterday. I've just suddenly gone a bit tired. Yeah, it's today. catching up with me a bit. Yeah, yeah, but... Uh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's good. I haven't caught wild carp for years. I mean, there's hardly any about nowadays. I know. I've not caught them. Oh, I won't tell you how many years, but this is how I started my carp fishing with wildies. Yes, same for me. Did you see that one? I did. Now, that was a carp, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely a carp, yeah. Well, there's some lovely little stalking swims around the back, but with the wind blowing down here, I'm going to set up to your left and float fish, and you're going to ledger across, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I'm not normally one to uh, go in for the purest train of thought. There are people that collect old fishing tackle and use old gear just for the sake of it, really, and if that's what they enjoy, that's fair enough. I've always been a believer in using the best tackle I can get for the job. So I'm not a great romantic, but I am going to use a centre pin reel for this fishing. I've got a centre pin here, and I've got an Avon-type rod it's got a one pound test curve. And for real close range underarm type fishing, I think they're very, very good. And you can control the fish and stop it running by just literally breaking the spool with your thumb. So I'm going to give the old pin a go. And if I have to fish further out, I'll probably go onto the fixed spool. But it'd be nice to catch them on a centre pin. Well, I'm going to start off with fairly traditional baits. I've got some sweet corn, some bread, and some of this luncheon meat. This is called boosted meat, and it, it tastes really meaty. Um, now, of course, if you're going to use luncheon meat, don't leave the tins around on the bank. Put it in your bucket, as I do, or in a, in a waste bin or whatever. What I'm going to do with this meat is I'm going to chop it up into cubes. So we're going to start with fairly traditional baits, like the meat and corn and bread. And then, well, if we need to, we've got other more modern baits in the van. But I'm hoping we can catch the old way. It'd be nice. A lot of people struggle with hooking bread, but it's not that difficult. You take a nice pinch like that, that's about the size of a... 10p coin. You literally put the hook around it like that so that the flake's lying flat and then just squeeze around the eye so you create like a pyramid shape with a lovely rough fluffy texture on the bottom and the job's a good one. Right, I'm going to fish quite close in here to start off. Got some nice cover. So it's as good as anywhere at the moment. Well, this is turning out to be a lot more difficult than we thought. 
We've tried float fishing and sort of straight ledgering with general baits. We're just getting annihilated by small fish. We haven't actually seen a wild carp yet, not for definite. I have had a few fish swirling at pieces of bread and dog biscuits out in front of me there. I'm gonna put a bit of crust on the hook here. out there. We'll see if that's far enough. Got him. I've had to try and stop this fish going into the weeds, keep the rod tip down. I think I've lassoed it now with the line. I really made a power rush there for the weeds at the back and I've just got to keep it away from that snag as well. Just took my popped up bait there. I had to wait a long time for the bite. It's coming in really peculiar way. It's, it's almost as if the fish has lassoed itself, but it's out of the snag. Here it comes. Gotcha. Well. It certainly looks like an old fish. The hook has actually pulled out. That was very, very lucky. And it's shot out of its mouth now and into its ventral fin. I think I'm going to call Mick in on this one. Mick? Oh, you've got I'm one, sure mate. you saw the disturbance. You've got one. I think this is a wild carp. It's yeah. got a really extended mouth. Yeah. And it's a very dark colour. Yeah, it's exactly as I remember them. Very dark on the back and that lovely golden belly, but and there's that sort of strange coloration to the fins. There's a red there, but you can't quite discern it. Yes. And uh, you've got to remember these fish have been feeding up on trout pellets, so they'll have a bit more, you know, a bit more belly on them than than the normal. Well, wild carp. one thing that convinces me it probably is a wild is the way it fought. It's a small fish, but my God, did it go? Oh, they it do fight, yeah. Yeah. It stormed off me. Yeah, you get your money's worth with these lads. Oh, superb. Yeah. You've done it, mate. Well, I think I have, and let yeah. me tell you, it may not be the biggest carp I've ever caught, but it was one of the most difficult to catch. Yeah. It yeah. really was. It's been so excruciatingly difficult. Okay, and there he goes. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly happy it's a wild carp, and I think we should take that one off. Don't tell me I haven't hooked him. <laughs> <laughs> Missed him. I picked a buffoon for a partner. I've had enough. I've missed 12. <laughs> I've missed... <laughs> I've never had such a bad run. I think we're going to pack our bags and... We've got the wild cart, we're going to pack our bags and head for the next species. I think I might, I might be entrusted to something a little smaller, don't you? Well, we stuck around just hoping that Mick <sighs> could get hold of a, a wild cart and really... With the way you're going on, Mick, I think the safest thing for us to do is to get out of here really quickly. Yeah. Uh, we've got to go to Wales now anyway, so uh, I, think, I think we will move on. Yeah, I th think it's about time. Well, here we are. We're in the Welsh town of Landissel. And in fact, Mick, before we go fishing for our next target species, we've got to get a ticket first. So you get the tickets for the Landissel Angling Association here in the Porth Hotel. Well, what are the prospects, Matt? Well, I think the river's quite low and clear. And uh, any fish in the system have probably been in here a little while. Yeah. They haven't had any rain for a while, and we're right at the end of the season, Mick, so... So you're, gonna, you're saying, really, it's going to be difficult? <laughs> uh, it might be difficult. You know, it could be iffy, but it's a very good river, this, and the lad that we're going to be fishing with, uh, Stefan Jones, he's been brought up on the river, so yeah. he knows it as well as anyone. You yeah. should find him up here somewhere. So will you be fishing the fly? I'm on the worm today, Matt. 
Well, I think that's disgraceful. I suggest you walk several paces behind me. <laughs> I will be fishing the fly, of course. Nonsense, that's the old school. The worm rules on this water. So, Stefan, you've been fishing this river ever since you were a kid, which isn't that long ago, actually. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, you've done a lot of fishing down here on the Tyvee. First of all, tell us a little bit about this sea trout, the fish that the Welsh call the suin. Um, they're genetically the same fish as a brown trout. Uh, the only main difference is, well, from the name sea trout, they actually run to sea. Uh, some return later in life when they're six, seven pounds or even bigger. Now, looking at the river at the moment, this is the lowest I've ever seen the Tyvee. First of all, and bearing in mind it's a race against time, we've only got to catch one, Steph. <laughs> um, how do you rate our chances? This is actually uh, similar low. Uh, this is similar levels for us uh, here in the Tyvee. Um, perseverance, it really is perseverance. There's a really good chance uh, in the daytime, you're really talking about fine tackle, uh, really light lines, but we've got a really good chance of still getting them at night. Today we've got a bit of cloud cover, so there's a really good chance of getting a fish after dark. Well, we'll give it our best shot. Bear in mind, we have only got to catch one, Steph. What I suggest then is if Mick's going to do some spinning and maybe some worm fishing, I'll stick on the fly. If you go with Mick and maybe take him through the best runs, um, at least we're dividing our efforts and giving ourselves a really good chance, I think. That sounds great, right. yeah. I'll stay out your way anyway. Good luck, chaps. And to you. Good luck, Matt. What's the biggest mistake that inexperienced anglers tend to make on this water? It tends to be in the daytime. Um, they tend to be rushing into the rivers a bit too much and splashing about a bit too much. You've got yeah. to be a bit cautious with your wading in the daytime. Yeah. Um, that tends to be the biggest problem. You've got people making the well transition from reservoir fishing and lake fishing yeah. into river sea trout fishing. They, f they tend to forget that these are a lot more wary fish, especially in the daytime. So basically, we're, we're just going to cast a worm into the current and let it come around. Yeah, we've got a very big stone up at the top here, which is a very good lie. Yeah. Uh, it's actually a very good yeah. salmon lie as well as a sea trout lie. Um, we want to be trotting it down this main current. Yeah. Uh, you can see where it drops off into the main pool here. Yeah. So we're just going to be searching out the areas of the pool, yeah. but the fish will yeah. be tending to lie more or less in the main current. Right, so we're fishing the worm to start with. Yeah, that's right. And, and I understand the idea is to sort of flick it upstream keep a tight line and feel it down the flow and you're feeling for the bite. And That's, yeah. Now, what sort of a bite is it? What can I expect? Um, it will be a quite a heavy, more or less a, head, a heavy head shake. Yeah. And then yeah. the fish will move off with the bait. Yeah. And when you feel yeah. it move away with the bait, that's yeah. when you start to lift. So you feel the bite and you go sort of one, two, three, strike. That's it. And it's on. And, yeah. And then all hell breaks out. Oh, definitely. Yeah. We're expecting that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I need to set the clutch sort of fairly slack or... Very light. Very yeah. light. Yeah. yeah. Because the first run... The first run is... Yeah. That'll be the one that's yeah. going to break. And me. you can tighten yeah. it up a little bit afterwards. I wouldn't yeah. recommend tightening it up too much, but... Yeah. yeah. Well, let's get a worm on in this stride. Let's get in there. Do you think those fish know we're coming? No, we're doing all right. Not going too heavily, so... Beautiful clear water. It's really nice. It seems to be just in that slack current just yeah. after that stone. I think he might be still be there. No. I think he's had that worm good and proper. Get a few takes anyway. Yeah, now there's bites again straight, straight away. Well, oh, they're, they're enjoying the worm. Just round the tail? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Well... <laughs> it's a start, Nick. That's a start, isn't it? Definitely. Is that actually a brown trout? No, that's or... actually a salmon pie. Yeah, Still chewing away. There's something on there. Yeah, I've got a better fish here, Stefan. I'll tell you what, I gave it a lot more time then. You see how much time they do actually yeah. need? This could be the swim we're looking for. I hope so. I presume it pays not to bully them too much. No, remember we're on very light tackle yeah. again. Like, this is the only time you have to yeah. be quite wary of what you're fishing with. I've seen it. It's not a huge fish, but my goodness, it's pulling. Oh, <laughs> let's Spirited get it to jump. Yeah, let's get it in the net and we'll, we'll know what it is. OK, it's right. in the net. So what and have we got? that is a suin. We've got a suin. We've got a suin. <laughs> I've got a suin. No, you haven't. You've got a rainbow trout. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How unlucky can a man get? I've had some bad luck in this series, but uh, 
Are there many of these in the river? It's only the second rainbow trout really? I've ever actually seen come off the Tyvee in all the years I've been fishing here. Yeah. So I congratulate you in one sentence, but then the next sentence, you know, <laughs> the fish will be in the river, so... It's just not going right for me in this series, but to every cloud, there's a silver lining. And, and I'll tell you something, we might be quids in here because we do need a rainbow trout, and we are going to target them on another water later, but if we don't get one, I'm going to count this one. <laughs> As long as we get one. Yeah, that's the main thing. That's actually a brownie. So we've got a brown trout this time. That's a brownie. Well. Another salmon part. Well, the first few hours of the visit have passed without a result and uh, dusk starting to gather. So if we need to, we can fish on here tomorrow, spinning and worm fishing, which is probably really the best chance of a sea trout. But we've decided to fish into the dark and fish tonight in the hope of picking up the fish early, because if we can get this fish, we'll head out. Well, standing in the middle of the river now with Stefan. We had a couple of hits just after dark. Can't tell really whether they were sea trout. And really, I guess this is the true essence of sea trout fishing, isn't it, Steph? To be yeah. in the dark, just casting into the darkness, alone with the sights and the sounds of the river. And uh, ordinarily, I'd be enjoying the experience, but the pressure's starting to tell now. We could do with the fish. What do you think our chances are, mate? I think there's a very good pull towards the bottom of the stretch. I think we should give it a quick half hour there, uh, see how that goes. Otherwise, we're going to have to give it a bit more perseverance tomorrow and see what tomorrow brings. Tomorrow's yeah. another day. running out of time because the moon's out now, it's getting quite bright. That's not good, is it? The only advantage we do have here is we've got a very high bank behind us with lots of trees, uh, so it's keep, keeping it relatively dark here. Well, I think tomorrow it'll probably be spinning and worm fishing. And if that doesn't work, Steph, I'm contemplating dynamite. Well, I think you mentioned that. I think I've got a nice supply in my shed, actually. Yeah. Come home to a real fire by a cottage in Wales. Exactly. <laughs> the plug, Steph. Well, this is incredible. I've got a fish on. It's not a huge fish, and we're not sure what it is yet, but it's just come tanking down the tail end of this pool, and it's really going across the current in this fast water. And we're not sure yet whether it's a brown trout, a large brownie, or a small sea trout, and we're hoping it's the latter. Really powerful current here. Should get him the nest. Yeah. Oh. It's in the nest. What we got, boy? Do you want the good news or the bad news? Give me the good news. It's a sea trout. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> well done, Harry Potter. <laughs> well, look at that. Look at the size of the lure. It slammed it right off the top. And it's, it's Stefan's great big Ballyduna bomber, <laughs> as I call it. And this is the sea trout. Let's hold it here in this water. Just talk us through, Steph, what we're looking at here. Well, Matt, as you can see, the fish is actually uh, quite dark, which means it's been in, in, in the river system for quite a few weeks now. I would estimate it's been in for about, uh, well, over four weeks for definite. Uh, but a bit of a fish, no, nonetheless. Yeah, well, I felt I earned it. I felt I was casting well and fishing well and, you know, that we deserved mm. one, really. You fished very hard. And, and obviously, with your, your guiding, we were on with a good chance. You can see the fish is really recovering well in this oxygenated mm. water, beautiful, clear, tivy water. And she's just wriggling there, she's ready to go. So I think what would be a good idea, Steph, I know it's not the biggest sea trout in the world, but we certainly owe this one a massive favour. Yeah, right. So I'm going to take her out a little way out there in the gentler water and let this one go. This looks good here, Steph. Yeah. It's a bit gentler. Just pop her in. Well, lads, it's ridiculous o'clock. But I think we can honestly say it's been a good night's sport. 
Steph, put it there, mate. Short but sweet. No, oh, no, no, no. Well done. We're delighted. We've got a sea trout. We've got a rainbow trout. So, Mick, what next? Well, there's reputations at stake here. You know what it is. It's the catfish. We've got to get back on it. I All think right. we can do it, you know. Well, I hope so, Mick, because if you don't catch one, you're going <laughs> in. So, uh, I think we've earned a night's sleep. We'll, uh, we'll head off back to uh, our B&B, get a bit of sleep, and then tomorrow, we'll go and find ourselves a catfish venue. This is Burton Mere, it's near Chester, and it's been a long six hour drive, but I think if we're gonna catch a catfish, this is it, mate, this is your best shot. Well, I'm here now on the main mere at Burton Mere, and in fact, this is a very interesting lake. It was built by the Prime Minister, Gladstone, but it's matured into an absolutely gorgeous, classical estate lake really and a couple of the big features in this lake are the islands you can see now that island over to my left is an obvious area to put a bait and i'm looking at a gap between two bushes and i want to try and squeeze a bait as tight in there as i possibly can it's an awkward cast it's the sort of place where people are usually going to struggle to get a bait without a bait boat and you might be wondering if you do a lot of casting to islands well how do i ensure that i drop the bait right tight to the cover um, every time without either overcasting or losing my rig. And the best thing you can do is to make a series of trial casts using the line clip on your reel until you get it exactly right. Now that one's just dropped about maybe a metre and a half short. So if I let out a bit more line on here and then try another cast, I'm just popping the line under the clip until I can cast really tight to the island. Obviously, you don't want to leave your line clipped up because if you do that and you get a big fish take off, it's just going to break your line. So you want to be able to fish as normal. How do I get back to the position where I can put that line in that clip in exactly the same place, exactly the same amount of line? Well, the answer is leave your line in the clip after you've made a cast that you're happy with and ship your rod back like this and in the tip ring, tie in anything bright that you're gonna see in the dark. Now, a lot of people struggle with tying the sliding stop knot. It's not actually that difficult. Just take a reasonable length of whatever you're gonna tie your stop knot with and form a little overhand loop like that, like a little kiddie's balloon with two ribbons coming down from it. And take one of those tag ends and literally pass them through the loop and over your main line. And I'm gonna go about five times there until I end up with that. And then by pulling on the two ribbons of the balloon, the tag ends, I can create a nice neat little stop knot right in the tip ring, trim both ends off so that they're nice and neat. Now, the point is you'll be able to see that under a head torch in the dark and in the daylight it's very very visible so I can drop that bait back on the same spot every single time and that is very very important especially when you're fishing to islands. Well, when the catfish takes a bait, it's usually quite a violent affair. So to allow for that, what we have to do is put the reel into free spool. And that means now that the spool can turn freely and give line while the catfish runs. And the action of picking up the rod, turning the reel, disengages the free spool, and then you're free to play the fish normally. Well, because of the lack of runs, I've gone down on the sensitivity of my tackle, I've gone down to an eight pound line, a little feeder packed with chopped worm and half a worm on the hook, and I've actually got a run. <laughs> it's not the catfish we're after, but it, it is nice to catch something after all this time. It's actually quite a nice tench, really. It's not a huge one, 
potential great fighters on light rods. Well, we've gone so long without any action. This is uh, it's quite welcome little tench. Very, very good condition, actually. Well, hooking this tench has made me realise that although I've gone down with the tackle, I've gone down to quite a light line, eight pound line, compared to the 15 pound line I was using for cats. I'm beginning to wonder now whether I'm going to land a good catfish on this gear and it's not really fair to hook one and, and lose it. So I've had a bit of fun. I'm going back to the heavy gear for tonight. John. Well, we cast out at dusk, set our traps, and it's now the middle of the night. This is the last chance for catfish. Um, we're not going to catch one by accident, are we? No, no, that's for sure. It's just the way this whole thing's gone. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed with myself, really, because I really thought we could do this, you know, get the whole set, but um, I, I think it's looking like we're not going to get the catfish. Mm. Line's just shot out of the clip on this rod. It was a real sharp bang, just one pull. I can't feel anything there. I'm going to wind down and have nothing there. That may have been a half chance. I've probably blown it. Well, this is it, really. The final piece of drama, it's just before dawn. I put out a half-dead bait, a roach head, after missing a couple of twitchy bites on worms earlier on. I've had a blistering run, hooked into a powerful fish, and it's trying to run me round the back of this island here, and I'm just praying that it's a catfish. It's a very strong fish. We fish really hard. <laughs> There's just no way of knowing there's something big out there in the gloom and it's really fighting. There it is, whatever it is. Oh, I, I saw the tail. It looked like a cat to me. I hope it is. It's either that or a big eel, I think. Please be a catfish, please. I saw its tail then, mate. Yeah. It's a catfish. Right out in front of us now, mate. Matt, it's a catfish. Oh, <laughs> it is. is. It? Yeah, I've seen it. Oh, don't say that. I don't believe you. No, it is. <laughs> Hang on, concentrate. Get ready with that net, mate. Don't worry, I'm ready. It's coming. You tell me when to slip it right in. Right on the surface. Hang on. Just eat the drag up a touch. She's coming up now. Right, this she's time, Matt. Just... She's coming now, now, All right. now. Yes, yeah! it's a catfish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well what done, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. <sighs> On a dead bait after I'll all I'll tell that. you what, we've had some close ones, but this is the closest, isn't it? Yeah. I'll say a few more hours and we would have gone. Now, these fish grow considerably larger than this, but it's a perfect specimen. First thing you'll notice is it's got these two feelers at the front here. Now, they're used basically to locate prey, and it's believed that when they're actually in feeding mode, they lock out rigid like two rods, and they can actually gauge the size of the prey with those in the dark. So it doesn't matter how coloured the water is or whatever, the catfish can lock onto its target and engulf it. And this is a very voracious predator. If you look inside the mouth now at the business end, Look at these two pads. There's one lining the underside of the jaw and then one on the upper edge. Now, running my finger across there, it's just literally like running it across Velcro. They're tiny little teeth, but what they're for is gripping the prey. Where it is actually um, dealt with, if you like, is down here at the back of the throat. Now, inside there, there are some crushing pads. And basically, once the food is taken into the mouth, the gripping teeth at the front hold onto it, and then it's passed down to the pads and it's literally pulped up. Now, in the UK, left to its own devices, a fish like this would probably grow to something like 30 or 40 pounds. That would be its natural ceiling weight because of climate, because of available prey sources. But on the continent, in the right water, with the right food, believe it or not, these fish can grow to several hundred pounds. Now, this one isn't several hundred pounds, but let me tell you, 
Mick and I have caught a few fish in our lives, and this one, <laughs> I think it's probably the one that we're most grateful for. It weighs something like 15 pounds or so, and it's fantastic. What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna slide her over the front of this, and I'm gonna hold on to her for a second, just to make sure she wants to swim away. I'm just gonna turn around now, like this, bit of sideways pressure. She's going. She's going the wrong way. <laughs> Not that way, that way. That's it. Go on. She's gone for a sulk under the weeds. I'm going for a sulking brownies bivvy with a nice cup of tea. That's what I'm going to do. Yes! I'll put the kettle on, mate. A well-deserved cup of tea.